Good morning, everybody. This is Tuesday, the 30th of June, and I just had to check that. And in the UK, it is 11 o'clock. I am speaking to you from France, where I have a house, and um, we snuck away while we could, with a view that we might be able to even get back into the country at the end of it. So bear with me if the location looks a bit different. I want to welcome my three guests. First of all, I'll go to Tanya Bowers, who everyone will know because she joins me very regularly on these Question Time Live. Tanya is the legal counsel for APSCO and will be kind of taking all the questions on furlough scenarios, redundancies, or any of the other legislation or potential changes in legislation that we need to focus. We might even wander a little bit toward Brexit. Let's see how we go on that. Um, I also have two APSCO members here who I'm really grateful for them to give us their time. I have Matthew Bayfield. Matthew is the CEO of Parity Group. He joined Parity a couple of years ago in 2018 as the MD and has come from outside of the market, mainly a career in data consultancy and really from that IT background himself, has brought some quite big changes at Parity that I'm going to uh, ask him some questions about because I think you're going to be interested in his views, not only on Parity, but his views on the recruitment market. Parity is a big player and has been for a very long period of time, 45 years, um, in the IT recruitment market, but also Uh, and everything with 70% in the public sector client base and the rest of it in the um, private sector. I'll also come to my second panel member, which is Gina Swain Rutter. Thank you again to Gina to come. Gina also joined um, Douglas Scott two years ago. Douglas Scott is a very well-known, generally permanent legal recruitment company with a number of offices around the UK. I've um, been going again for a long period of time, set up originally by Kath Riley, who I know very well, and has done a great job with that business. Gina's come in, as I said, from outside of the recruitment market, having had a career originally firstly actually as a chef but then in the legal market as a business person commercial director in a legal firm before coming into recruitment again a legal recruitment company but coming from something different so we have two of our panel members where this will be the first recession as we head through uh, that they'll see from a recruitment point of view and both with different views of running recruitment companies coming from different backgrounds and inputting some change. So I think today we have a fantastically interesting panel and I think what I'm going to do is come to those panel members and get them to tell a bit about the businesses. Gina, if I come back to you, Douglas Scott, you came in two years ago. What did you find and what were you planning to do, let's say before COVID? What was the plan? Uh, so the plan, I actually finished my MBA um, really um, maybe a couple of weeks before I started at Douglas Scott. Um, and of course, I had all these really great ideas on business principles and how that would apply in, in different industries. Um, and so I actually came in uh, thinking I was going to rewrite recruitment, uh, essentially, and, and, and rewrite what, um, you know, essentially I knew uh, from a high growth um, uh, business historically. Um, and really all of that went out the window whenever I first started. Um, and, you know, whenever I came in, I chose to go and work for Douglas Scott because it was such an amazing team. Um, they all uh, worked really passionately for their clients and it had a really great reputation. And whenever I came into the business, um, I did actually realize that, you know, the business essentially had a lot of really good behaviors in it, but it also had a lot of damaging um, behaviors in it. You know, we had a, a leader there who was brilliant, absolutely brilliant, who would lead from the top extensively, but almost too much. So the workforce began to um, feel like um, they, they didn't do anything without their own motivation, um, really. So we're still trying to rebuild our, our, our leadership team in respect of that and getting encouraging people to make their own decisions. And, and during this whole furlough process, making sure that people feel that they are um, able to air their opinions and also run with some projects as well and, and take their own initiatives. So I was 
I was really surprised whenever I first came into recruitment, just how much reliance there was on one or two business leaders to really drive that forward. Um, and of course, in, in any business that's looking um, for, you know, in the future to potentially look at private equity or any type of investment, uh, that leadership team is key. People are, are investing in your leadership team as well. So I was, I was very surprised at that fact and that actually needed a lot of unpicking and then rebuilding, uh, which we're, we're midway through that, I would probably say. Yeah, well done. Matthew, let me come to you. Realistically, you've come in to be CEO of a PLC. That's a very different ball game to being pretty much a serial entrepreneur that you've been doing histor historically. What differences do you see in coming to run a recruitment business i know there's obviously different uh, parts of parity but also a company that is a public limited business yeah a lot a lot of differences right it's um if you've ever been your own boss i know that people who set up their own businesses tend to be very driven and know how they want to do things when you step into a publicly limited company that all goes out the window you have a, a lot of bosses you have a lot of people who can trade in your business regularly you have a lot of expectation on you in terms of the way that you will report the forecasting of the business, all of which are disciplines that um, don't come naturally to entrepreneurs, right? One of my favorite entrepreneurial sayings is ready, fire, aim. Yeah? yeah. Being in a PLC feels like ready, aim, 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 fire. So it's, uh, there's a big turnaround there. I also think there's, um, there's a lot of benefits to being in a market in terms of liquidity if you're in a market that's feeling liquid so fundraising becomes a much easier proposition because you can go and raise funds quite readily again any strong strategy um but right now the aim market is not particularly liquid so that benefit uh, and i think to, to your other point about coming into parity the, the biggest opportunity around parity is taking the heritage of this brand that's been around for a really long time that has a strong reputation, particularly in public sector, and, and making it future-proof, making it more forward-looking. So instead of being a retrospective business that had strengths over a long period of time that it was kind of eking out, um, it gets on the front foot and it becomes a lot more proactive about finding out what clients really want like, why are they paying you money? What are they actually interested in? Um, um, that's my strongest belief in everything I've been involved in. If you're really obsessed with your clients and you really get to know them and understand their desires, you do well. Okay, so what about the contractors, though? Because if you don't have contractors that you understand as well, you don't have a business in the recruitment market. What are you doing to look at what contractors want, what contractors need, to make sure you've got the best ones there? Yeah, that's, that's a, a really key point. I was remiss in not bringing that up. The, um, the, this, I like this word community a lot, right? That if we represent a sector of expertise, let's say it's data, let's say that within data, there's a few different groups of people, maybe architects, maybe systems analysts, maybe reporting guys. The, the way that you can really get close to that community is by talking to them and understanding their language and their requirements. Now, I'm relatively fortunate that I've been quite hands-on in the data world. So I know a fair amount myself and can have a pretty informed conversation with a data architect. But that, that I think is the value that we add to the contractor workforce. Above and beyond, as, as we've discussed, being able to find them the right role and get them the right terms. If we understand their challenges, um, I can give you an example of putting in a very senior data chief data officer into a business right quite often people will expect that individual to arrive and solve all the problems irrespective of what exists in that business and that's a really lonely place to be and if they feel like they've got a community um we add some significant value to them so i, I hold these round table meetings and have, i've done two of them on zoom since we've been in lockdown with with the senior data people where we can all kind of no holds barred share some of the challenges of being expected to be superman and fix the world's problems all on your own yeah do you think i mean was the recruitment market different than you thought it was going to be when you arrived were there any big yeah. surprises yeah very much so 
very much so. And I, I'm, I'm super interested to hear some challenges against this, but my view when I first started to kind of lift the, the bonnet on this business, the operating model was based in like the 1980s. It's, it's an operating model that's predicated on some really old school business mentality around commission driven behaviors that somebody will only do their job well if there's a big old carrot at the end of the day. And that, that trickles down through a lot of the different ways that the business is set up. And so I, I, I felt that it was really holding the business back because the structure of the way that we employed people, that they reported into other people, that they were rewarded was um, not very helpful, not very purpose driven at all. And um, so I, I can only talk really about parity. I, and I would love to hear other operating models from the recruitment market without you know, causing anyone offense, but it didn't feel to me like it was fit for purpose, that it, it was reflecting the true value chain in this proposition, which is somebody needs some skills. We can go and find those skills and we can bring them together. The commercial model under which that operates could be really flexible. If you want to, yeah. if you want to skill on a day rate, that's one way of doing it. If you want us to manage it for you as an MSP or as, as a consulting project, that's another way of doing it. If you want to upskill your people, that's another way of doing it. If you want to have a, a project-based fixed deliverable, like they're just commercial wrap for what is essentially the same proposition. You need skills because you don't have them. We can go find skills. The commercial bit in the middle needs to be much more flexible, I think. I think, look, I think there are a lot of businesses out there that have different models. And if you look at the commission based model, most recruitment companies will have commission oriented, but there are some big ones, some very well known ones, Michael Page, that have never had a commission structure ever and uh, work in a completely different way. There are other ones. So people run their businesses differently, attract different types of people, but there's no question. There's a lot of moving forward. And I wonder whether COVID is, is going to be a catalyst for change, which is kind of interesting. Gina, do you, when you came into the recruitment market, into Douglas Scott, you saw some things you wanted to change. Have you found that you've changed the way that you hire people, the consultants, the way you train them, the way they're managed, the way they're remunerated? Is that something that you've changed already? Yes. Yeah, so I think um, whenever I first came into the business, uh, what I did see as a, a bit of an issue was that that working culture uh, that we um, often see in recruitment businesses where you have the big billers who uh, can sometimes be mavericks and, and get their own way whenever they want. Um, and then you've got certain individuals who are just in really, really um, dug deep uh, their heels into the culture and are actually part of the culture of the workplace and actually can be quite combative and against any kind of um, processes you put in place or, you know, like Matt had said, you know, purpose uh, as well and, and, and very anti, um, especially at, at our size and probably a lot of the other uh, businesses that are on here uh, that are a lot smaller. Commission is how you retained your staff uh, historically a lot of the time and, um, you know, even whenever we were looking at our, our commission structure recently, which we, we have, um, and uh, we have uh, looked back at it and restructured it. We were actually paying 55% of our revenue out to our sales team. Um, so that payout percentage was just wild, absolutely wild. But, you know, we've gone through a period over the last probably, I would say, five to seven years where everybody wanted our staff. Everybody wanted them to go through um, uh, a well-known, experienced recruiter like Douglas Scott and Kath Riley, our founder. She does the training herself. Um, so they, they, they actually became a wanted commodity. So before we knew it, we started having people coming to the founders at that time to say, listen, Joe Schmo can give me X, Y, and Z, and you know, firm A and B can give me X, Y, and Z over there, always kind of honing what they were telling us into what they wanted us to do. And at that time, you know, retention, if you only base your, your business model on that um, extrinsic value commission and no intrinsic value whatsoever, which is that purpose-built and purpose-led kind of initiative, 
you are going to always have to play uh, uh, with the big boys in regards to paying people, you know, much more, more than, than, you know, potentially yeah. some individuals were worth at the time. So, um, yeah, I was very surprised at that. And I was also surprised at that kind of how hard it was for us to go from extrinsically led um, um, business model into a hybrid. You know, we, we, we have people who want to come in, they want to earn money, good money, that's within their DNA, that's fine. But without losing that kind of client candidate relationship and that, you know, any, any, any result is a good result kind of mentality, you know, so having a bit of a, a, a both on intrinsic and, and extrinsic um, uh, motivating factors has helped quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, I would certainly say that most people listening this morning would think that if you're paying out 55% of your revenue in salaries or in packages, you, you're in a hiding to nothing. The figure was always about 30% is the way it should be. And, you know, the other 60 pence spent on other things. But generally, in my day, you worked out about 30%, sometimes a little bit more. And actually, salaries and packages in the recruitment market have come down in the 30 odd years I've been in recruitment, amazingly, because I think it just wasn't a viable business model. And I think that's right. And sometimes you think that maybe the caliber of recruitment consultants has also come down. Um, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Let's have a look at COVID and what your two businesses that are very different, one legal, um, mainly a private sector, obviously legal firms, plus some in-house stuff I know as well, to something that's contract, has a solutions part of the business, is 70% public sector oriented, um, and, and obviously very contract. What's been going on? What have you seen in the difference between pre-COVID and COVID marketplaces? Matthew, what have you seen that's been different in the business? Not necessarily figures, but attitudes of customers yeah. and the way that you're running that business. Um, one of the first things we set out to do um, as the world went was to set up a daily call with clients and contractors to just check in, right? And so first you were having lots of, this is really weird, isn't it, type conversations. How are you finding working from home and all that kind of personal building relationship stuff? And it's a relationship business, right? And then we started to see a divergence in the way those relationships were growing. The public sector was feeling pretty secure. And the people who worked in it were, were pretty predictable in the way they were behaving. And so we saw a real steadying influence. We're so heavily public sector from, from that world the private sector just the wheels fell off it was um it was really shocking that some of our large private sector clients uh, who are heavily retail based just had to shut up shop right and and if you're if you're in quite large as we are with these businesses into many millions in terms of um revenue and that and they're closing all of their stores you can imagine the kind of conversations at a board level that you're having to have which is you know, how much bad debt can you carry? Um, so the, the very different, you know, um, I know that from the pre-talk, Gina and I have got very different experiences in this because we haven't had to follow anyone. We haven't followed anyone and we haven't had to make anyone redundant. We were already in a restructuring phase uh, coming into this crisis. So we were kind of, if you like, very fortunate. We'd already got to the point where we were the size for the business that we had. Um, but so I, I don't have a tremendous value to add in terms of the furloughing process or redundancies because because we haven't done it. But from a from a market perspective, public sector, very steady, almost. A, we went for the Office of National Statistics and there's been an increase in demand from them. Um, so very, you know, very safe, very secure. It feels as though these people are, are all, you know, trundling on at the same kind of path and the same rate. Private sector, it, it was some D-Day type conversations of, you know, what happens if this extremely large household name goes under, which uh, I've never yeah. really been in that position before. You know, and, and I guess that's still going to be something that we're going to have to face for the next few months. And of course, when you're running a company the size of Parity, you're not as agile as you would have been in a startup scenario or in a small business. If I, if I come to you, Gina, agility is kind of 
pretty useful in the current market. I know that you took some decisions early on with regard to redundancies, with regard to furloughing staff. Where have you come from? What decisions did you make and how are they panning out? Well, I think it's probably useful for us to start pre-COVID as well. So whenever I started in, in 2018, we had a number of individuals who with our commission structure and, and so on and so forth, uh, we're not paying their wages, let alone putting any profit on the on the business. So we did have to go through a little bit of a restructuring exercise there, but also the regeneration of, um, you know, just a high performance culture and what that means. Like I referred to before, um, a lot of that had to do with people taking their own initiative and, and driving things home and, and taking um, ownership a lot of the time. So we set out an EMI scheme an enterprise management incentive for um, all of our uh, team leaders at that point. That gave them uh, ownership over what they can control um, based on, on our experience. And so it gave them three KPIs, simple KPIs, which was NFI per head, the number of people we have in their office. Largely we're in control, not of everything, but of, of vast majority of those options and then one that's a little bit woolly which was the multiple of our business um, as well so how are we looking at that and that's where the conversations came in about the purpose-led um, kind of initiatives that we were doing so on the run-up to COVID we had increased our forward sales by 134 percent so as at the end of March we had a million pound of forward sales and that was actually quite helpful for us because we had that money coming in, even though revenue wasn't being generated at the top line. So that was really helpful for us. A little bit disappointing because we worked so hard to get to that point, only for it to come to a grinding halt. And you know, whenever we go back to March time, I went to America, my dad um, unfortunately passed away, so I had to go back to America. When, when I left um, England to go to America, we had you know, 150 new job inquiries every day coming into us. Um, whenever I came back, which was after a week after the lockdown uh, had been instigated, uh, we went from to, to four job inquiries a week. Um, so it just nosedive, completely nosedive. So we knew we needed to do something quite quickly. And we took the decision to furlough all of our, our team. And that was largely because um, a lot of our clients we were speaking to just said, listen, it is unethical for you to just be bouncing down my door talking about X, Y, and Z, there is a pandemic happening. So we took um, the, the uh, I guess the stance to kind of just give them a little bit of space and let them work out. There's a lot of change in our business and we had to be empathetic of, of what was happening with our clients' businesses as well. So we ended up furloughing all of our team um, and we also put in employee assistance programs because we knew, you know, being secluded at home was going to be tough for a lot of people. So that mental well-being was important to us. You know, we started doing uh, pub quizzes on Zoom, Zumba sessions on Zoom, you know, just to get people involved and, 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 and integrated with each other still so they didn't feel so secluded. Um, we looked at our civils application, you know, that was the hot topic. I know you guys spoke about it in, in your question time quite a lot uh, two months ago, uh, so we did that. Um, but once we let the dust settle in regards to that, got ourselves, ourselves in a situation um, that it wasn't panicked, we started looking at um, what does our business model need to look like? If we were to set up tomorrow, what would, that, what would we want it to look like? Um, and some of the um, conclusions that we came to was um, number one commission was, um, you know, paying that level out to the payout percentages was just far too high. We needed to address that urgently. Um, we also realized that even though we had done quite a lot of underperformance management uh, in the months prior to this, we still had, um, you know, six, seven people. 65% of target and um, essentially with that 65% of target and our commission scheme that means we're not making any money so um, we had a look at them so uh, we did actually let six under performers go and we also looked at redundancies for the ops team um, we were very back office support heavy compared to the number of sales uh, people that we had so um, for us to kind of make sure that we were leaned up um, and, and ready for the recession, um, you know, 
there's news out today about um, the contraction in, in GDP being 2.2% in, in quarter one alone, and then 20% reduction in, in GDP in April. So we are going to have a, um, a, bit, a big dip that we're have, going to have to contend with. So really we wanted to restructure everything, and we wanted to do that early. You know, you change commission schemes and, and things that have been driving people for years, almost decades before this, you are going to have a little bit of, um, you know, behavioral kickback uh, on occasion, you know, and um, so managing that as quickly and as swiftly as possible uh, to keep that trust with our individuals and let them know, listen, we're not making any more changes for the foreseeable. Let's kick on to the positives. So, you know, what we're getting ready to do is on Wednesday or well, tomorrow, we are um, getting the guys back on flexi furlough for a day a week. Um, the reason why we decided to do that was we were going to look at beginning of September, getting everybody back. But by that time, the, the furlough opportunity from the business is, is going to be, you know, have, have, a, have a quick end thereafter. So, um, and we were going to be going from a starting start, uh, uh, um, a standing start. So we needed to make sure we were able to generate that demand quite quickly. So how we're doing that is one day a week, the guys come in, they use that flexibly throughout the week, however they see fit. Um, but there is one objective that we have uh, for them, which is generate as much demand as you possibly can, because if you generate demand, we can then unfurlough you um, for further days thereafter. So their future in regards to furlough is in their hands, essentially. And that kind of generates that sense of responsibility and ownership for our team. So that's our plan, amongst other things like you know, training, uh, we're currently reforecasting um, and, you know, doing tech and, and ops improvements whilst we have the chance in this downtime to make ourselves as lean and as effective as, uh, and efficient as possible for the future. I mean, it's been quite a useful opportunity for a lot of businesses to sort of look at themselves and decide who they want to be when they come out of the lockdown process and therefore people are making some big changes. It sounds like the two of you in coming in two years ago made some changes very early on. And I suppose then it's there's a less big change likely to happen during this, but actually following through with the changes that you took place. Can I come to Tanya with a few questions about furlough actually? I've got one in, can teachers be furloughed in the summer holidays? There's some mixed messages about that. We have a number of APSCO members in the teaching recruitment market in education. Tanya, can teachers be furloughed in the summer holidays? I'm afraid there's not a, an answer that I can give that's 100%, absolutely, definitely, for sure. You'll never have any problem about that. Um, the government, you know, the message the government consistently has given to us is through EAS and recently last week Jesse Norman answered who's an MP who's um, heads up HMRC in the Treasury um, in Parliament said yes teachers can be furloughed during the summer holidays as long as they're eligible so there we go as long as they're eligible for the scheme so you give with one you take away with the other so I think there's the, the the fundamental problem people have is furlough is about COVID related absence if teachers don't usually work in the summer holidays how can you say it's a COVID related absence which is the key to the scheme um, the government are saying well they're they're not having the opportunity potentially to work at holiday camps and other things. So it's okay to go on furlough. So that's sort of the government informal message. But then some of our members and particularly one or two of our umbrella company members who have a different relationship with their workers, they employ workers. So therefore during the holidays, they still have a contract of employment with them. And particularly one has got a barrister's advice that says, well, these people are on unpaid leave during the holidays. And it's very clear that you cannot furlough people when they're on unpaid leave. So I'm sorry, it's all a bit legal tastic here. But for umbrellas, they are probably quite uncomfortable about furloughing teachers during the holidays or might be. 
for our members that have agency worker contracts, then there's not this ongoing relationship. So in theory, they could restart their contract with them on the basis of it being furlough. I think there's less argument, it's unpaid leave, but nonetheless, is it really a COVID related absence? We are pushing, we're really pushing Bayes to push HMRC and Treasury for more feedback on this. We've done it again last week. Last week, they pushed back with the Jesse Norman response saying it's fine to furlough, but we've pushed back again, <laughs> going, no, no, we really want something in writing from Treasury on this. So I'm afraid at the end of the day, our members are going to have to make their own individual assessments based on how much they really, really definitely do want to help their teachers during the holidays or whether they are happier to take the less risky, well, the safer approach, which is choosing not to furlough teachers during the holiday. There's the other point as well that from the beginning of August, recruiters and umbrellas would actually have to start financing the furlough because they have to start paying the employers NICs and the pension contributions. So I'm sorry, sl quietly, slightly complicated answer to a complicated question. Are we going to hear a definitive answer to this before school holidays start so that our members know? Pretty obviously, we advise people, people to be fairly risk averse, but I mean, they need to know, don't they? Are we going to get an answer? I can't promise they'll give an answer because they're always going to couch it with that if they're eligible. So we're, we're hoping we're hoping for something that at least says that being on holiday does not discount you from eligibility because it's not COVID related absence. They possibly could go that far, but they're not going to go as far as giving a view on unpaid leave in, in respect of particular contracts. I don't think they'll go that far. Okay. I'm going to stick on furlough briefly because we've got two very different um, attitudes to furlough. One company, Parity, not furloughing anybody, and uh, another company, Douglas Scott, furloughing pretty heavily. I mean, you know, all of the sales oriented staff and looking to use the flexible furlough. Tanya, are we finding through the legal helpline that most of our members are looking to use the flexibility of the new furlough scheme from the 1st of July? Um, I've had less, we've had, I think we've had less queries on flexible furlough than I would have expected. And I'm not quite sure why, whether it's that people are just bringing their staff back or whether they're leaving them on furlough. Um, what we have had is do you have to issue a new agreement for all staff or do you just issue a new agreement for those going on flexible furlough? Um, if the, it's a, you only need to issue a new agreement for those that are moving on to flexible furlough. If they're staying on full-time furlough, then that's fine. You don't need a new agreement because really the only thing we've changed is you, I've done it by way of a schedule so that in the schedule you say which hours you're working and which you're not. Um, so you could issue a schedule every week or every month or as regularly as necessary. However, it's really important that you do have that written agreement in place before you start flexibly furloughing because that is in the guidance and in the Treasury direction that it has to be in writing. Before. Okay, Gina, just to let you know, the performance of all of that kind of stuff is on the APSCO website. Download them. They're very well written and it saves you heading anywhere else, but they're there for you to use. Pretty obviously, Matthew, you're not going to need to use them. Um, can I ask another question that's come through, which is kind of an interesting one. It might be interesting you having come from that sort of data background. A question here is, in light of increased ransomware attacks and the fact that hackers are always ahead of the security products, what kind of backup and disaster recovery do you have in place at Parity to make sure that you survive any attacks? One, have you had any attacks? And two, how savvy is your security systems at Parity? 
Okay, it's a really um, pertinent question actually. The, the, the biggest area I see growth in the real short term in private sector will be around cyber and it won't be around software, it will be around training of people. So we got um, into partnership with Cybergym and Cybergym is set up by the Israeli Electricity Board. And I don't know if you know this, but the Israeli Electricity Board is the single most hacked entity in the world. So more people have figured out that the easiest way to destabilize that region is to turn off the electricity than anything else, right? And they'd spent something like 47 million pounds on software a year, right? Wow. It's a phenomenal amount of money to spend on software. It melts my brain. And they were still getting hacked because it's us. It's all of us who get an email and click on the link that says, can you just, you know, drop your password here? Or can you respond to this phone call? Or can you open this? Or can you... And it's the people, it's the training scenarios. So Cyber Gym set up this thing whereby they get us in a classroom and it's kind of white hat versus black hat, right? And they try and hack you and they send you phishing attacks and they send you malware and they send you stuff that you're gonna see if they're gonna open it. And, and really the biggest impact you can have, and this is something we've done, is train your staff. It's not about investing in antivirus or investing in I guess one of the analogies is, right, you can build the biggest, highest wall in the world, but if you've got a guy manning the gate who just lets people in, it doesn't really matter, right? So it, it's, that's, what, that's been my approach to this, really, is to look at people, is to educate people. My, my guys get um, emails all the time purporting to be from me, right? So the email address that I'll get it from will be like Matthew Bayfield at squiggly, wiggly, blah, 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 blah. And it'll be, hi, just, uh, could you just drop me a password? I need it for something signed with my name. And that happens, I don't know, like 10 times a day. And so you, you, I think that's the, the, you know, if I'm giving advice in this area, it's much more, yes, you need to have your house in order in terms of vigorously defendable VPNs and you don't want to make it easy, right? So firewalls have to be in place. But your biggest vulnerability is your people. And the easiest way to get around that is with some pretty straightforward, simple training, right? Don't immediately click on a link in an email. Do check and verify the address that it came from. Just, it's pretty straightforward stuff, but that, that in, in my opinion, is, is where the money should be spent. I, I, I don't know about you, but I watched a lot of Game of Thrones. That's what I did in my evenings during lockdown. I've gone through the whole lot, having never seen them before. I always think when they're attacking a castle, why don't they just go through the gift shop? You've only got old ladies in there normally that just let anybody in. So I, I agree with you. It's the person that opens the door and lets everybody in. It's interesting, isn't it? Okay, there's a good question from out there. Let me ask some other questions here. We're seeing the market changing. There is a flood of candidates now on the market, which is suggestive of there being a more client-driven market. What are you, are you seeing something similar to that in parity? And what are you planning to do about it? Yes, I think one of the, the, one of the things I can share with people um, openly is for, for a typical role, in a senior data position, we were seeing somewhere in the region of two to 300 applications per role um, pre-COVID. In the last two weeks, that number has gone to three to 4,000 applications per role, right? So you're looking at somewhere between a 10 and 20 times increase in the number of applications per role. And, and in fairness, and you've probably got a lot more experience in this than I have, but it's obvious to me that the market is shifting from, you know, a supply demand. The, the, the curve is going to flip on its head. That's going to have implications because people are going to be willing to work for less money a day. So, you know, if you've got three candidates, a rule of a varying quality, but could do the job, the one that's coming in at, you know, 50% of the price of the others is going to be more attractive. I also think that that's going to have, diversification implications for the contractors themselves, right? So there have been people who've been able to trade as, let's say, an Azure platform specialist for the last 10 years. And they've only had to know one trick. They've just had to know one piece of software and one. 
that's that's going to change dramatically because you're probably not going to be in the assured position you were before of there always being demand for that one thing. Um, so I, I don't have the answers to what that then looks like for us. I know that the key plan that I have in place is to stay really close to the client demand and talk to them about what they need and to see how that's changing. Um, and I, I'd love to get feedback from other people on this, but I see a massive shift towards digitization at the moment. I mean, it's probably so obvious it doesn't require saying, but lots of businesses are now having to figure out how to do what they did before online. And, and that means that there's, a, there's probably four or five key skill sets in that area that are good, the demand's going to go through the roof. And they, they might not have been uh, as highly sought after. The virtualization process, who, who's going to want a server room that's locked in a building that you can't get into anymore if you can virtualize the whole thing and stick it up online? So a lot of changes, right? And I know from previous experience in other businesses, there are winners and losers in recessions. And the, the winners tend to be the most flexible, adaptable, attentive, reactive businesses who keep their ear to the ground. And the losers tend to be the ones who keep trying to find a way to make the old model work. So, you know, what, what we did before, we just need to find a way to make that work. So I, I, think, I think I see a lot of exciting kind of challenges coming up, but my, my kind of pathway through it is very much talk to people. Go and talk to clients, go talk to contractors, have conversations on a daily basis. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting time. I tend to think that sometimes in a recessionary period, it's the bigger businesses that can be slower to move, less agile, and the smaller businesses have an opportunity to snatch some market uh, because they are more flexible. Do you see the permanent legal recruitment market coming back so that you will have a full complement of consultants delivering services to your client base and indeed those candidates? Do you see it coming back soon, Gina? Um, so I already have seen um, there be a pickup in the market over the last three weeks, I would probably say. And that is um, another reason why we led to, instead of waiting until September, pull that through to the 1st of July when that flexi furlough comes back. Um, I do agree with you that it's, it's definitely gonna be a, a client market in, in our market at the very least. Um, and that is um, what we saw as a business in, in the recession a decade ago. Um, so in a lot of the guys that we had um, operating the business at that point are still there. So we've got a lot of that really good experience of, you know, recruiters of 20 plus years experience who have been through these recessions before which we will need because we also have a lot of new starter newcomers into recruitment and, and they're probably, well, they are definitely most, most um, likely to go to speculative CVs, you know, taking really good candidates and taking those out to market and getting your result. And that um, process is, is it's going to be a steep learning curve for everybody. So we are actually um, using the, the furlough time. Um, so of course, work one day a week, but we're also doing training sessions for people on, um, you know, the change and what your BD now needs to look like in, in this new world uh, that, that, that we're coming into. Um, but yeah, I, whenever I went to the legal forum, um, uh, on the APSCO uh, panels that you guys have had, which I have to say have been absolutely brilliant in, in allowing us to see what other people are doing, but also formalizing what we should do as a business. And everybody is really, really quite positive about that market in, in legal. And, um, you know, if we're looking at a, a V uh, recovery, which is you know, what, what I believe is, is going to happen. I believe we've already started making our way up towards that, that upward tick, um, which um, is actually quite um, encouraging given, you know, what the country has just been through and, and the damaging, you know, business reports that we're, we're having on, on the impact to the economy. Yeah, um, a question that's coming is in, in about investment in small businesses. If smaller businesses are looking for investment, what should their directors focus on to add value or to make them more attractive? Do you have a view on that, Gina, from your MBA time frame? Have you got a view for a smaller business? What would make you look more attractive to someone who would look to invest? So for, for us, it's, it's about your EBITDA and your EBITDA per, uh, percentages. That was largely what, what drove um, that element and that growth. You need to, you need to show 
uh, that there's, you know, the last three to five years worth of growth in your business. So that, and then also potential to grow thereafter, uh, after that. So of course, those are headline um, aspects that everybody would imagine. But whenever we were going through the due diligence process, whenever we went through the private equity deal in, in legal, um, you know, you have to have due diligence on, on everything. You know, whenever we're talking about, you know, people asking about servers and, in in um, uh, your your integrity of your data is questioned. Your finances have got to be on point. Your leadership team have got to be absolutely. Uh, they're investing in that because, of course, you as a business leader will eventually uh, no longer be required after a period of you know handholding and making sure everything is still, the wheels don't come off of it whenever they do invest. Uh, essentially, so that leadership um, I think is the biggest challenge for what I've seen in smaller recruitment businesses. A lot of it is led very heavily from the top which is great and it's very aspirational and there's lots of really really good recruiters out there um, that are taking these businesses and skyrocketing them but once you're gone you're gone and we're left with that leadership team and in that operating model that you've left behind and that's what we're investing in so um to me the leadership team um and and um that's got to be the biggest thing that I would uh, that I am currently trying to fix in our own business. So I would definitely advocate that for others. Okay, I've got a question here with regard to the public sector, um, who are looking for in certain areas are looking for candidates to fill in questionnaires, looking for their ethnicity, and the question is should should our contractors need to fill this in and who's you know responsible for them tanya can you do the legal bit and then i'm going to come on to matthew to ask about working with the public sector what is it that we're doing in the recruitment market to help that inclusivity agenda so i'm giving you a little bit of warning there tanya who needs to fill in those questionnaires um and who's responsible if we have a contractor or a temporary person in the public sector from a health and safety point of view can you answer that question for me um yes we this has come up on the help desk a few times this week we've had um i think nhs employers are starting to send out um, a questionnaire particularly um focused at bame people and their health and I think our members feel quite uncomfortable about this because there's not a huge amount of context about it in terms of what they're going to do with this information and what risks they're trying to balance because there's not a great understanding of why people with BAME backgrounds have suffered more in COVID than others. So our advice is push, particularly if it's before, if it's a sort of interview introduction stage, push back because we're, we're quite worried that it will be used as discriminate, you know, or it could arguably be discriminatory if they don't proceed or that could be argued by the candidate. But of course, always involve the candidate in the decision making process. Clearly, they need to be involved in the supplying the information, but try and get as much information from the client as possible as to why they need it, what they're going to do with it, where they're going to store it, how long they're going to keep it, all that stuff. Um, so that the individual is making a informed choice and it would be a lot harder for the client to sort of, you know there for it to be an argument that that they discriminated on that basis um and what about i, I was at a forum yeah, and, and in terms of who's responsible for the health and safety i was at a forum or one of our forums yesterday actually it was the legal not the legal um sector group which i was on with gina last week so that was nice to see you again uh, but it was the actual legal forum and one of our really larger members said they are pushing back saying it's the client that ultimately is responsible for health and safety if you have a number of agency workers on a production line and some of them are permanent some of them come from agency a some of them come from agency b clearly it's not acceptable if one lot's wearing visors another lot's in full ppe with a mask and a visor and one lot are just wearing their own glasses. So clearly, you know, that really is a good example of how it has to be the client that drives this. And really it's our job under the conduct regs to make sure that they have done a risk assessment, that they have 
considered agency workers in this risk assessment and that they to feel you know for them to tell us that they have mit sought to mitigate risks and they have sort of followed through on the outcome of their risk assessment okay thank you matthew so i'm coming to you with regard to so much of of the work is done by parity in the public sector are you finding that the public sector are handing out questionnaires on the ethnicity of people and if so are you complying with that and also i'm wondering whether the recruitment market you two have both come into this recruitment market are we a catalyst or potentially a catalyst for change to help to get more of a mixture of people across the board into our end user clients but also into our own businesses okay um no the public sector are not asking questions about ethnicity um they're, they're very very strict in terms of the way that they approach the the legality of being seen to be either pro-discrimination or, or discriminating i think there's a, a slightly broader thing around that for me which is seeing a lot of these technical high-end jobs where where the recruitment criteria is very much predicated on have they done exactly this thing before right and i'd say that the area that i'm most interested in shifting mindsets in the public sector is the adjacent skill set and the fit of the person to the team that they're going into rather than they tick all the boxes because they've done an, an exact sql development in that framework over that time period and it seems to me as though there's almost a willingness in the public sector to overlook um, some of the softer skills and, and the fit piece in favour of uh, a, a particularly well-matched set of tick boxes. So does that therefore open the door to um, inclusivity and diversity in, in hiring? And, and is there a way that that fit angle starts to direct people away from some of the more well-trodden pathways right like if you if you're only ever recruiting based on the, the skill sets that somebody's already got you're only ever going to get from an ever decreasing pool of people i mean that that makes sense to me um to the second part of your question do we have a responsibility yeah absolutely we do the the, the way that we recruit our own people and this possibly circles back to operating models and things around commission and traditionally who's been attracted to working in these heavy sales environments if you if you start to generate a more purpose-led business you're going to attract a different type of person in i i, I find it a bit of a um a very difficult area for me to navigate in terms of whether or not you should have quotas whether or not you should be thinking about you know people from different diversities or genders or any of the protected characteristics that feels to me like you're just filling in boxes and you're just trying to redress a problem by creating a new problem whereas if if you're if you're coming back to this fit and purpose and that people are aligned behind it that overrides these other characteristics and you'll end up with with people who are aligned behind something rather than just people who fall into one type of trait so i don't know it's it's definitely we have a responsibility for it do i have the best way to do it no i don't am i interested in all the options that people are exploring yes i am yeah i mean the reality is if you don't measure something it suggests it's not important and that important things need to be measured but it's difficult isn't it it starts looking awkward but i think you know i think there's a real opportunity to be a cap catalyst for change in the poem market what do you think it's different difficult in the legal market to, to make maybe big inroads but do you see a recruitment company as the potential to be a catalyst for change uh, definitely. So when Law Society, maybe about five or six years ago, put in place a diversity and inclusion charter. Um, and that does um, look at, you know, the improvements on, you know, what types of certain individuals you have within your business. And I think that was a good driver. Do we have a long way to go? Certainly. Um, and I think that goes for, for every aspect of, of discrimination. I'll, I'll um, give you an example. Um, probably November of last year, I had a situation where one of our um, managers and, and head, of, head of Midlands, he came to me and said, um, 
I want to talk to you about this candidate. Um, this individual, she's an absolutely brilliant conveyancing solicitor. Um, she, you know, used to be paid uh, forty-five thousand pounds. This firm has X, Y, and Z experience, um, but she's gone off and, and had a had a baby, um, and she's taken a, a year off, and now she's going back in to um, to, to work for. 10k less than than what she was on uh, historically, and that was just a one one year uh, uh, time off with 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 raising a, a newborn child. And to me, I think that there's there's ways that we can go about it, which is building the confidence of individuals, um, and that is going to feed into this purpose led um, um, business model that we've been talking about uh, so keenly today. Is, is is that difference that we can make as as a as a staffing uh, company? Um, on the on the lives of people who are undergoing such um, terrible discrimination um, on on all walks, really, um, and um, and yeah, it, it is our responsibility to, to 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 try to to rectify that. Okay, so there's a real opportunity there, um, and that we can make a change. I think we need to measure the change that we make. Um, but certainly we should be a catalyst for that change. I think it's a role that we should take up pretty proactively. I know that Douglas Scott are members of Women in Recruitment, actually, that APSCO run and are pretty active. And I know that you work with female solicitors, making sure they get a good opportunity um, out there in the legal market. So, so well done with regard to that. I'm going to bring you. our session toward its close. It occurred to me that, Matthew, I didn't ask you about what parity you're doing for the staff. You haven't made anyone redundant. You haven't put them on furlough. But if you had three things that you are doing with them, what would they be? Because I'm heading toward the end of my time slot. Okay, I'll be really brief. But um, I, I don't know how useful it is for everyone else, but we, our great place to work score went up by 35 percent after covid uh, the three things that we did we instituted a fortnightly co update and i talked to everyone and they get to ask me any questions they want and that's the first time everyone in the business has been able to do that that regularly we have a fortnightly toolbox session where somebody within the company gets up and talks about something they're either passionate or an expert in and they basically upskill everybody in the company and we have created the social stuff that you would expect around Zoom and pubs and drinks and all that good stuff, although that's kind of died off. But um, I have to say, I've been really, really pleased, surprised and proud that just by engaging with people on a regular basis, even though these are all people, people who want to be around other folk, um, they've, they've really, you know, the scores have gone up, which is I'm very pleased with. Because however you're organising your business, you still need those staff engaged and you need them to want to be working for you because there are a load of businesses out there that would love to take good people. Yeah, well done. Okay, why don't I close up this session by thanking both of my APSCO member panel members and of course Tonya. Thank you, Matthew Bay Bayfield, CEO of Parity. I know you've been in the market two years, but welcome into the market. APSCO runs so many dinners and other events that we will make sure that you mix and mingle with a whole load of other people running recruitment companies as soon as we can get back to a restaurant um, and help in any way we can. But I really appreciate your time and your openness and honesty. And also Gina Swain, uh, Rutter, thank you very, very much for coming in. Um, and it's a different marketplace, the two of you got both of you coming in simultaneously. Welcome again into that recruit market, and I hope that you really enjoy it. I'm sure you will, actually. What I do need to tell everybody out there is, one, there was a question. Yes, we are taping this. It will be on the APSCO website. You, it will be downloaded either by this evening or certainly by first thing in the morning. So if you want to play it back, please go and do so. But also the financial planning panel, that's quite difficult to say in a hurry actually, financial planning panel uh, is chaired by John Rose. It's this afternoon at 2 p.m. on Zoom. Um, it's about workforce planning. Um, sorry, another panel is on workforce planning. That's chaired by Kai Murray on Thursday, again at two o'clock in the afternoon. Please do register on the website or contact Josie Holroyd. Meanwhile, what I would say is continue to be safe. I know I've come on holiday. It's a private house in the middle of nowhere. 
and we're only going to the shops here in France, but restaurants are open actually, Alan. They will be again soon back in the UK. Please stay safe. I'm not sure about staying alert or after um, stuff happening in the Tory party, maybe it's just staying elite, but stay safe and let's speak to you again next Tuesday at 11 o'clock. Thank you again, panel members. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank Thank you. Bye. Bye.